pranam to professor tanu patmanabhan who breathed his last on september 17th morning as all of us know it is a big loss to the entire scientific community in the country he is such a legendary personality one of the most promising scientists of the country an eminent theoretical physicist and cosmologist acsc has organized one week long commemorative webinar series to pay homage to professor tanu padmanabhan and the webinar series is organized in association with kerala university mg university cochin university of science and technology and calicut university this program is hopefully attended by faculty members researchers and students from colleges and schools and also scientists from r and d institutions today the fifth day last day of the webinar series starts with a welcome address by professor k p sudhir principal secretary to science and technology department government of kerala and executive vice president kerala state council for science technology and environment this state level program is presided over by dr v p mahadevan pillai honorable vice chancellor university of kerala <coughs> patma shri m c dattan former director vikram sara by space center and mentor science government of kerala will be the guest of honor and will deliver a special address the memorial lecture is delivered by dr davud kotawala department of physics iit madras concluding remarks will be delivered by dr p harinarayanan principal scientist kcst and also the co convener of this program which will be followed by vote of thanks by dr cbks who is the professor and head of uh, department of physics university of kerala now may i request professor p sudhir to start the program and offer welcome address sir please thank you ajit am i audible yes sir yes sir yes. professor mahadevan pillai honorable vice chancellor of university of kerala patma shri mc mentor to science and technology to the chief minister of kerala professor dabud dabud kotwala iit madras dear colleagues scholars and friends i welcome all of you for the the final day of the the lecture series that the kscst organized as part of praying paying tribute to the eminent scientist professor tanu padmanabhan we had arranged a five day program in association with various universities in his memory and several distinguished scientists have delivered lectures during the last four days the untimely demise of professor tanu padmanabhan is a loss to the scientific community across the globe we have listened to several of his associates speaking about him and his profile of research on his platform on this platform during the last four days i would like to borrow and caught a script prepared by his own students about him at this moment which was shared with me by one of my colleagues at iit madras professor tanu padmanabhan known affectionately as paddy in his close circle passed away on september 17 2021 at the inter university center for astronomy and astrophysics pune he joined the tata institute of fundamental research mumbai as a faculty member in 1980 before moving to iuca in 1990 where he stayed his stayed till his untimely demise in his illustrious career spanning more than four decades professor tanu padmanabhan contributed significantly to a broad spectrum of topics related to astrophysics cosmology and classical and quantum aspects of gravitation his research during the early days was aimed at exploring the implications of the quantization of the conformal degree of freedom of space time which led to interesting results such as the avoidance of singularities and the nature of space time at short distances subsequently he investigated the manner in which semi classical gravity can be arrived at from a complete quantum theory and examined within semi classical gravity he examined the phenomena of vacuum polarization and particle protection in different situations including non trivial effects that arise during the 
inflatory apo in the ec universe early universe and around black holes simultaneously he studied the formation of dark scale structure in the universe utilizing semi analytic methods and well extensive numerical simulations around the turn of the century with the advent of precision cosmology he worked on understanding the observational evidence of the cosmological constant as well as its possible nature and origin during the last decade and a half motivated by the thermodynamic nature of gravity he was developing an approach to the emergent gravity paradigm and exploring his ramifications paddy was fascinated by the cosmological constant and in fact one of his recent aims was to understand the microscopic nature of the cosmological constant in the context of emergent gravity paradigm an important and distinguishing feature of paddy's career has been his conscious effort towards writing textbooks aimed at students at different levels he has also authored many popular science articles and books which have motivated students to pursue research in physics we believe that this article his articles book and lectures will continue to inspire generations of students and researchers to take up the challenge of understanding the laws of nature during his career professor patmavan received numerous awards both at the national and the international levels including the insa young scientist award in 1984 the shanti swarup bhatnagar award in 1996 the millennium medal in 2000 the al kaswami international award in 2002 the migyuna award of the melbourne university in 2004 the padma shri in 2007 the inaugural infosys prize in physical sciences in 2009 the third world academy of science prize in physics in 2011 very recently he was conferred the lifetime achievement award by the kerala government of kerala for the kerala shastra puraskaram in 2021 notably he also won the first prize in the gravity essay contest in 2018 2008 awarded by the gravity research foundation usa he was a fellow of all the three academies of science in india as well as the third world academy of sciences <laughs> paddy was a guiding light for all of his students and postdoctoral fellows who have interacted with him light having gone out has filled us with the insurmountable grief and sorrow paddy was a father figure and a close friend to all of you his sudden demise leaves a deep void behind he will remain in the memories forever paddy holds a singular space in our scientific journeys and in his inimitable irrespectable and intense manner made our lives richer and engagement with science deeper in so many ways he leaves behind an intellectual legacy of the highest caliber we hope our memories of paddy will give all of us the strength to carry this difficult time and his energy and enthusiasm will remain with all of us a constant source of motivation and inspiration this was a paragraph or or a uh, note prepared by his close associates and students and postdoctoral fellows who had directly worked with uh, professor tanu padmanabhan so i thought i would share the same thoughts here uh, uh, before we uh, uh, conclude this meeting so this was actually planned as a uh, this this webinar series was planned as a five day program by the kerala state council for science technology and environment government of kerala and in association with various universities and uh, uh, i am pretty sure that the last four days we had interesting lectures by different eminent uh, personalities on different topics of physics theoretical physics and associated uh, subjects and i'm pretty sure that today professor davud also is going to give us a good uh, lecture on uh, uh, his uh, experience with professor patmanabhan and his research so i welcome all of you once again to this function i don't want to extend my uh, uh, talk any more because everybody is eagerly waiting for the talk to hear so thank you ajit thanks and and over to you thank you sir thank you now may I request uh, uh, dr dp mahadevan pillai honorable vice chancellor university of kerala for his presidential address sir please esteemed professor KP Sudhir executive vice president of Kerala State Council for Science and Technology the distinguished professor from IIT Madras 
ഡോക്ടർ ദാബൂദ് കോത്വാല പത്മശ്രീ എം സി ദത്തൻ സാർ ഫോർമർ ഡയറക്ടർ ഓഫ് പി എസ് സി ആൻഡ് മെമ്പർ ഓഫ് സയൻസ് ഗവൺമെൻറ് ഓഫ് കേരള ശ്രീ അജിത് പ്രഭു ആൻഡ് അതർ ഡിസ്റ്റിംഗ്വിഷ്ഡ് ഗസ്റ്റ് ആൻഡ് ഡിയർ ഫ്രണ്ട്സ് ഐ ആം എക്സ്ട്രീംലി ഡിലൈറ്റഡ് ഓൺ ഇൻഡീഡ് പ്രിവിലേജ് ടു ബി എ പാർട്ട് ഓഫ് ദിസ് കമ്മറേറ്റീവ് ലെക്ചർ സീരീസ് being hosted as a tribute to one of the greatest researchers of the century and son of our soil patma sri tanu patmanabh i offer my rich tributes to his memory filled with a deep sense of pride appreciation and respect for this researcher who shed new light and thoughts on several dimensions of astrophysics and specifically on gravitation and cosmology what makes him unique is his passion to learn ponder and introspect over nature and science through inner experiencing with very fine and vivid understanding this being the fifth commemorative lecture i am sure the webinar would have extensively deliberated upon the life and contributions of dr tanu patmanabhan i personally believe that the richest tribute that we can offer to this great man of vision is to carry forward his dreams on research on astrophysics and meaningfully blend the same to the same to academics being from kerala and more from the city of trivandrum i believe that this initiative should come from this soil university of kerala is willing to carry forward this dream i congratulate kerala state council for science technology and environment for their initiative in hosting this event and would like to reflect upon some key achievements in the illustrious career of dr patmanabhan dr tanu patmanabhan was one of the renowned and prominent theoretical physicists and cosmologists who passed away at the age of 64 on 17th september 2021 in pune at his own residence although he is not with us anymore his many his masterful contributions in science are ever enlivening and enriching for times to come patmanabhan did his schooling in trivandrum and earned his bsc and msc in physics from university college tiruvananthapuram under kerala university as the vice chancellor of the university i joined the university team in offering our homage and tributes to this eminent alumnus of university of kerala he published his first research paper when he was still a bsc student that is at the age of 20 he joined the tata institute of fundamental research for his phd in 1979 and became a faculty there he moved to pune to work at ayuka in 1992 and served as its dean core academic programs for 18 years from 97 to 2015 from 2006 to 2009 he served as the chairman of the time allocation committee of the jained meter wave radio telescopes of ncr he was the president of the cosmology commission from 2009 to 12 of international astronomical union and was selected as the chairman of astrophysics commission 2011 to 2014 of the international union of pure and applied physics dr patmanabhan worked actively to popularize science 
and gave over 300 popular science lectures and uh, authored more than 100 popular science articles. In 1991, he authored his uh, book, authored with his wife, Vasandi Patmanavan, the book named The Dawn of Science, which takes the reader back to the early history of all the science, all the sciences, starting from the antiquity to and uh, ending roughly at the time of Newton. In another masterpiece book, after the first three minutes, the story of our universe beautifully addresses the story of evolution of our universe, formation of stars, galaxies, and the new, new scientific understandings of these profound and fundamental issues. He received many awards. Professor K.P. Sudhir Sar mentioned uh, most of them. I'm not uh, again repeating it. He has owned, uh, authored many other books, uh, quantum field theory, the why <coughs> that is in 2016, gravitation foundations and frontiers in the year 2010, courses on theoretical astrophysics series, structure formation in the universe in, 2000, in 1993, and innovation to astrophysics and uh, quantum themes and the charms of the micro world in 2009. In the earlier part of the Padmanabhan's career, that is from 1980 to 2001, he made uh, important contributions to quantum cosmology, structure formation in the universe, stat and the statistical mechanics of gravitational gravitating system. In 1980s, he came up with an interpretation of the Planck's length as the zero point length of space time based on very general consideration. This result established by theoretical considerations and well chosen thought experiments finds an echo in more recent results in several other candidate models for quantum gravity. He developed a the complex path method in 1998 uh, to study black hole thermo thermodynamics, which was a precursor to the tunneling paradigm that becomes great popular later on. He was recognized, he was a recognized authority in the subject of statistical mechanics of gravitational systems and was a pioneer in the systematic applications of these concepts to study the gravitational clustering in an expanding universe. His interpretation of gravity as an emergent phenomenon like elasticity and or fluid dynamics and showed that uh, this paradigm extends to a wide class of theories of gravitation including but not limited to general relativity. Padmanabhan could show the, that several peculiar aspects of classical gravitational theories find natural interpretations in this approach. Such an interpretation also provides a novel solution to the cosmological constant problem. He gave two lectures at the Oxford Cambridge Collaborative Conference on cosmology and uh, constants of nature about this. In, in November 2016, Patmanavan published the, the research studies advocating a new paradigm shift in understanding gravity. A key question in quantum gravity lies in the understanding of the primordial and pre-geometric space of the universe, which from the classic, which, which the classical and geometrical phase described by Einstein's equations emerges along with the notions of space and time themselves. Patmanabhan introduced the notion of cosmic information called a cosmin, which allows to connect these two phases in a fascinating manner. Cosmin, which is conserved, which is a conserved quantity, measures the total information transferred from quantum gravitational phase to the classical phase of universe. 
quantum gravitational consideration advocates an astonishingly simple value for cosmin that is 4 pi the number of information bits on the surface of a sphere of unit radius using this consideration cosmin was able to relate the numerical value of cosmological constant possibly the deepest unsolved problem in theoretical physics today to the energy scale at which the universe made the quantum to elastic transition this is the first time that a model with no adjustable parameters is able to provide a holistic explanation for both these observations which has far reaching implications for the quantum structure of space time let me conclude recalling this famous quote attempts to understand extra galactic objects and the universe by using the laws of physics leads to difficulties that have no parallel in the application of the laws of physics to systems of a more moderate scale thank you sir thank you sir for your scholarly lecture and also sharing memories and thoughts of professor tanu padmanabhan you have also paid befitting tribute from the kerala university which actually has molded him to this level and i believe kerala university can always be proud of him for producing such an eminent world renowned scientist thank you sir sir with your permission may I request now uh, the guest special uh, address by the guest of honor patmasri mc dattan sir dattan sir please switch over to dattan sir good afternoon to everybody am i audible yes sir audible sir yes thank you dr sudhir my colleague honorable vice chancellor of kerala university the reputed speaker of today's program dr raud my colleagues in the science and technology commission i mean council and all distinguished participants i think this is the last day of our program of paying tribute to the great scientist tanu padmanabhan i told the great scientist the great is underlined because there is a reason there are many scientists you know we know but uh, dr tanu padmanabhan is really unique in being a scientist by listening to various aspects about him from his friends classmates and students colleagues and many many people it was uh, really really you know entertaining to know what kind of passion and devotion he had with the science especially the physics of universe there is a saying that if you love your profession you need not work if you love your work you need not work what do you mean if you start loving your profession or work you know you don't feel that you are working but attaining that status you should start immersing to the profession your passion and devotion to the profession should be that much when you are in that status you won't feel that you are not separate from the particular subject of profession he has attained that stage and you know his passion for the uh, physics of universe astrophysics astronomy etc has started from his uh, school level and don't see as reached the college level even not college even the intermediate level he was in the pre degree course in the pre degree course itself you know his affinity to the science subjects especially physics was very very remarkable and his uh, classmates many classmates they have reported about it and after coming to the college university college you know his papers and you know uh, very interestingly when he was in the uh, graduate level of the course you know uh, he used to take class for the msc course 
and he was one of the member who were preparing the syllabus for the MSc class. So you can understand his level of understanding and level of uh, passion uh, towards the particular subjects. And after that, you know, later with the TAFR and the Winshoot at Pune, you know, he has reached the right place where he can do the maximum research of his field of interest. Actually, you know, his, even his family life was uh, really, you know, interesting in the sense, you know, he told his friends, you know, I can't get married, I can't uh, afford to have a second partner because my first partner is already the astrophysics. So I don't have time and I don't have time to entertain another partner. But later, uh, very interestingly, he changed that attitude by meeting across a similar scientist with the same passion in the same field and he could get a partner and have a life and the the daughter who has come out of both of these great scientists also has become an expert in the same field that is another most interesting thing and i was wondering you know in such a, a group of three learned scientists with the top brains especially in the field of you know physics of universe and the physics of universe is a subject where, you know, it never ends. And in whatever you read it, you know, again, it uh, go on like infinity. As uh, I was listening to the uh, lectures in all the last four days, the eminent personalities on various subjects, uh, very interesting thing. And, you know, just building up our uh, knowledge because I am not a physicist. I am a rocket scientist. So we have some connection with the, some of the subjects. That is the most interesting thing. Out of all the subjects, what is in his field of work, you know, gravitation, cosmology, quantum science, these are all the things. Out of this, I like the subjects gravity because we have some connection with that. And gravity has got the subject and I was so fascinated to, um, to know that today's talk is going to be on gravity. Uh, gravity with respect to space and time. You know, gravity changes with respect to space and with respect to time. That was very interesting to us because, you know, uh, from equatorial to North Pole and the South Pole, you know, the gravity varies. We have read. We have read because that has got a lot of effect in uh, designing the trajectory of our launch vehicles also. And also, uh, orbiting satellites and there is a difference of uh, um, a few units in the acceleration due to gravity also because uh, all these planets spherical we assume the spherical planets you know by rotating in a high speed it develops a kind of you know uh, equatorial bulge due to that there is a variation of that i am not going to subject uh, because i am not experts also but uh, I'm so interested that today, you know, Professor Dawood will be able to explain all these details to you people. I just wanted to hint one more area of interest is there the gravitational waves. Though the presence of gravitational waves we are talking since 1970, uh, it has been uh, detected experimentally with a very a special uh, uh, laser interferometry technique. Um, during 2016 February only. That was another interesting thing. I hope uh, uh, Professor Dawood will touch on the gravitational waves also because that also uh, breaks a lot of mysteries with respect to black holes. And uh, I mean, even the gravitational waves, I understand it can uh, even penetrate through the uh, black holes. That is another interesting thing we know it. And uh, Dr. Patmanavan, I mean, uh, Tanul Patmanavan has also done excellent work uh, the, on the field of gravitational waves also. Now, coming to his achievements, other than that, you know, how he conveys uh, the uh, science to the lower level. He has written, a, as uh, Dr. Mahadevan has pointed out, he has written a beautiful book with 24 chapters, Dawn of Science. Dawn of Science means Sastrodaya. That particular book recently has been translated into Malayalam, the beautiful book by Suresh Babu. 
it got printed printing is over now it is ready for release with the publisher of sprinkler uh, with the kerala uh, pasha institute that will be an excellent book for you know reading to the students and also people who love the science from uh, the origin of universe onwards the as he has told it over to 4500 years of the uh, science will be there from the pyramids years of 2500 bc to about 1700 ad where you know newton's law and theory was produced in that time these particular periods of the history glimpses of the history for the um, searching minds that is the uh, bracketed title it has been given to that that books also and of course if you would have been alive you would have got many 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 other interesting books and a person great scientist i again repeat a person like him uh, he only can you know enjoy the physics in a life and he used to make cartoons uh, illustrating the astrophysics details so he is by you know where he lives with that particular science and he didn't have any other thoughts we all you know read books and you know we have different type of uh, reading somebody taste it somebody chew it somebody eat it and other swallow it also as far as he is concerned the total uh, wisdom the total knowledge of the, the, the physics you know he was swallowing it and throughout his life you know he didn't have any other thoughts other than this particular subjects that is the greatness and that say i told you know he is really unique i am not uh, talking more on the my favorite subjects on the gravity and the gravitational forces because uh, the speaker is an eminent personality expert and uh, knowledgeable man in that particular field so i am stopping here waiting to listen to the professor daud on gravitation with respect to space and time thank you all thank you sir thank you for your very informative uh, speech as well as uh, sharing thoughts and tributes to professor tanu patmanabha thank you sir and uh, now it is the turn uh, for uh, dr daud kotawala professor department of physics iit madras but before that formally to introduce the speaker may i request uh, dr ar shariga scientist of kcst please for introducing the speaker thank you dr. sir Shariga. yeah it's my pleasure to introduce to you dr davud kotawala who will be delivering the commemorative lecture today dr davud kotawala is currently the associate professor at indian institute of technology madras after completing his phd from inter university center for astronomy and astrophysics in 2010 under the guidance of professor tanu patmanabhan he joined iit madras in 2012 His current research interests are in classical and quantum gravity and his expertise in astronomy and astrophysics are in black hole physics quantum effects in curved space time small scale structure of space time etc he has to his credit about 36 international publications with this i invite dr davud kotawala for the commemorative lecture over to you sir uh, am i audible yes yeah uh, thanks uh, professor sarika for the introduction uh, i would also like to thank uh, uh, professor sudhir professor pillai and uh, guest of honor honorable uh, shri dathan as well as uh, uh, professor ajit prabhu for coordinating this meeting uh, let me just share my screen if you can let me know when the screen is visible is my screen visible yes 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 clear yeah so uh, let me make it full screen and then we can so uh, uh, i will be speaking on space time and gravity classical ideas and quantum insights and my intention in this talk would be to cover the broad spectrum of topics that i usually work on 
and these are the topics which i have been continuously discussing with paddy so i will actually indicate uh, till as early as a week before he uh, passed on we were talking about these topics and i just wanted to give the audience a glimpse of what this means what it means for gravity to be connected to thermodynamics and how any of this will change when we incorporate uh, quantum mechanics into the picture okay so uh, let me start by mentioning a few words about my uh, th there have been a lot of nice things said about paddy by previous lectures as well and i would just spend a few minutes sharing my experiences with him and i would just want to start with a statement i wrote for paddy when i was acknowledging him in my phd thesis and this statement was actually spoken by russian mathematician arnold when he was talking about a book by isaac baro and baro for those who don't know was the instructor of isaac newton uh, in cambridge uh, i'm sorry in oxford uh, the statement essentially says that for modern mathematicians it is generally very difficult to understand their predecessors who would simply write bob washed his hands i'm paraphrasing where they should have written some complicated mathematical stuff like you know there is a t1 less than 0 such that image bob of t1 of a point t1 under some mapping is this this blah 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 the idea of this quote is to say that uh, really great minds would write would write get to the extract of a mathematical statement and get the real physical content of the statement without complicating it too much and that also happens to give you the glimpse of what kind of a person paddy was okay. and till as uh, briefly as a week before uh, uh, his demise we were discussing about topics as basic as lenz's law of electromagnetism and we were discussing lenz's law because we were discussing a slightly more complicated topic about what is called as diffeomorphisms in general relativity diffeomorphisms in differential geometry doesn't matter what the term means the idea is that we were discussing a very complicated concept from which the discussion uh, came to as elementary a textbook concept as lenz's law of electromagnetism so it was really great fun discussing physics from basics to most advanced to advanced topics with physics uh, with paddy and that was really a pleasure in working with him and he has mentioned it many times that one must do science or one must do physics maths uh, just for the fun of it not not th there are awards and monetary gains one may have but really uh, one should do these things for the fun of it if one really has to extract it was also mentioned by uh, one of the speakers before and that was the key to the research work of paddy and that's the statement theoretical physics is fun so i like like to put this slide here uh, this is a talk he gave in perimeter in 2010 or 11 i guess and i still remember that i was just winding up my phd when he came to my office saying that look there is a news article about a hollywood actress who seems to be very interested in space time gravity and all these things string theory and what not so can you make a nice image out of it and hand it over to me so that was really the fun thing about paddy he could talk about very advanced topics while making listening to those topics a fun uh, so just to give you a zoom up she was talking about indeed she was talking about time space string theory and stuff like that and uh, maybe it is a coincidence but just a few days before paddy passed on he was discussing with me a problem that uh, he had given me before i started working with ph uh, on my phd with him and that was a problem for my graduate school project we have to do a mini project before we start a phd and some for some reason uh, we got back to that problem after uh, after 15 or 16 years we got back to that problem and he wanted to clarify certain parts of that computation his last email was on 16 september evening around 5:30 pm and the sheer suddenness of what happened next 17 september morning i would like to say that it has the aura of a last grand disappearing act of a great magician which paddy was okay. so with these words let me get on to my talk what i want to do in this talk is 
give a very broad overview of the kind of topics that uh, I work on and I have largely collaborated with Paddy on these same topics. And these are topics uh, starting from the upper right corner of this slide. Uh, what is the space time look like at small scales? These are all interrelated topics and that is what I will try to convince you uh, uh, in the rest of the talk. So what does space time look like at very, very small scales? What is the nature of vacuum when you take into account quantum mechanics and curvature of space time? I will explain all these terms as we go along for those of you who are not very familiar with it. Then uh, what is the true meaning of the laws of thermodynamics and their connection with black holes? We know that black holes obey certain kind of thermodynamic laws, which I will explain as we go along. Just like you study the laws of thermodynamics, black holes also satisfy those laws. And this was the uh, very famous discovery by Stephen Hawking, Bekenstein, and others that they indeed behave like thermodynamic objects. What does it mean for gravity? And finally, the notion of entropy. What, what do you really mean by entropy of objects when these hot objects, say a hot cup of coffee, is placed in a curved space time? Okay. So let me begin. Before I begin my talk, I will just go back to very, very elementary high school kind of uh, cartoon picture just to give everyone an idea of what is the domain of physics that we are talking about. So I like to display this dimensional pyramid which I actually learned from Paddy when he was teaching elementary courses that you could classify all the physical theories based on the three fundamental constants that we know of. H bar, the Planck's constant which is on the vertical axis, the Newton's constant on the horizontal one and the speed of light or rather the reciprocal of speed of light on one of the axes. So depending on which point you are in this so-called landscape of physical theories, that determines what kind of physics you are talking about. For example, if you are, if you are looking at h bar equal to zero, that means that you are basically looking at physics where there is no quantum mechanics. So you're looking at classical physics and classical physics is governed by simply the speed of light. If the speed of light is taken to be infinity, you are doing Newton's laws of motion, for example. If the speed of light is taken to be finite, which it really is, you have to work with special relativity. And Newton's gravitational constant tells you uh, 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 what is the role of gravity in your theory. It's all classical theory, no quantum mechanics, only special relativity and gravity. So in this domain, we learn in our school that quantities can be measured to arbitrary accuracies. You write down Newton's law, you solve them, you get the answer. So if I tell you what is the motion of a particle, for example, at an initial time and what is its velocity, you will be able to give a definite answer for the trajectory of the particle. But we also know that quantum mechanics changes this picture. Okay. Once you incorporate Planck's constant in the picture, you have something called as an uncertainty principle which says that you cannot measure things like, for example, position and momentum of a particle to arbitrary accuracy. There is a lower bound to it. If you go slightly further, you can combine physics by incorporating both Planck's constant and the speed of light. This is the domain of relativistic quantum mechanics. Again, extremely interesting results come out of it. You have to work with what is called as Dirac equation and things like that. But on very, very elementary grounds, dimensional grounds if you have a particle of mass m which is quantum mechanical and relativistic then uh, you can localize the particle up to a length scale which is called as the compton wavelength which is given by h bar divided by mc again very elementary college level result but we will see that this all these things are going to play a very important role when we talk about space time itself at extremely small scales and that happens when you also bring in gravity into the picture. The moment you bring all the three constants, h bar, g, and c, and as it was just now mentioned in the introduction to Paddy by one of our speakers previously, it is then that something magical happens because as soon as you bring in gravity into the picture, Paddy was also one of the first people uh, who also showed that this provides a fundamental lower bound on how accurately you can measure space or time and more, uh, more properly space time distances. 
And your measurement of space-time distances at this most fundamental level is governed by what is called as Planck length. So this was Compton wavelength. It depended on mass of the particle. This is Planck length, which only depends on fundamental constants. It doesn't matter what is the mass of the particle, what is its velocity, what is its size, nothing. G h bar by c cube ka square root gives you the length scale at which it is impossible to localize space-time events. Okay, and that is going to be important in some of the works that I'm going to describe. Of course, the final aim of physics, the so-called holy grail of physics, is the theory of quantum gravity, where all three constants are going to play uh, the dominant role. So none of these constants are ignorable. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to be on this triangular region, this slanted face of the pyramid, where you turn on G, turn on h bar, turn on the speed of light, but you're still not doing full quantum gravity. And that was the piece that uh, uh, we have been working with, uh, with Paddy in collaboration with Paddy for several years now, that what can you say uh, about quantum gravity from physics at what is called as intermediate length scales, mesoscopic length scales, where all three constants are important, but yet you are not doing quantum gravity. There does exist such a domain and uh, we were trying to characterize what happens in that domain. Okay? So that's the plan of the talk. So let me start the formal talk now. That was just a prelude. Uh, since not everyone here would be familiar with general relativity, space, time and gravitation, I will give you a very, very mini lecture course on uh, what really is the connection between space, time and gravity. Why do we say that gravity is the curvature of space time? Okay, I will get you till Einstein equations. Then I'll discuss the interrelation between gravity and thermodynamics. Finally, I'll come to quantum space time. And in the end, I'll discuss the implications of quantum space time for the idea called as emergent gravity of which Paddy was one of the major proponents. Okay, and that makes use of connection between gravity and thermodynamics. So basically what you're trying to do is try to explain the connection between gravity and thermodynamics, starting from a microscopic uh, model of quantum space time. Okay. So let me start by describing space and time. This picture gives you a brief history of space and time. And if you really want to go back, I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, but if you really want to go back till the Greeks, uh, uh, till the time of the Greeks, uh, the study of space and time started by some of the arguments by Zeno and Aristotle. Okay, they were carried uh, forward, much forward in fact, by people like Newton and Leibniz. And most recently, it was Mark, Ernest Ma and Einstein who gave the, some of the most modern arguments for what should be the nature of space and time and what are its implications for, for known laws like Newton's laws of motion. Okay. So before Einstein, the notion of space and time, which we learn in school, the Newton's laws of motion, these laws are formulated in space and time where time just flows. It's a fundamental construct. Everybody agrees on what time is it. It's an absolute construct. And at each instant of time, you have three dimensional space and your history, your entire history or the history of the planet or the history of the solar system and so on is simply a stack of three dimensional surfaces evolving in that fundamental absolute time. Okay, that is the picture demonstrated on the left hand side here. What Einstein did was brought in special relativity. In special relativity, speed of light is the ultimate limit on how fast you can transmit information. And that has a very important consequence. What I have drawn here is your location in space time indicated by you. Suppose you send a light beam from this location and orange colored region is the set of all points where you can send your signal at a speed less than the speed of light. Since nothing can travel faster than speed of light, everything outside this cone is empty. You cannot communicate with it. Okay. So this is a very, very drastic change from the Newton's uh, notion of space and time because what it tells you is that at any given instant of uh, your history, your future is determined by a finite set of points lying inside what is called as this light cone, the orange colored region, because you cannot transmit signals greater than the speed of light. 
there is no such distinction of future and past in newtonian version because this whole three dimensional space lying before a given time is your past lying above a given time is your future einstein removed a vast domain of space time which is not accessible to you from consideration and this has drastic effects so this is the theory of special relativity in pictorial terms okay as you move forward from special relativity the next great insight by einstein was that gravitation is space time geometry so let me try to explain what it means this is usually the picture which is shown uh, and what it means is that every massive object produces a curvature in space time you can imagine a massive object being put on something like a rubber sheet and creating a tent in it that rubber sheet is a toy model for space time and everything else moves in this curved space time uh, according to certain laws which are the laws of general relativity for example earth produces a dent in space time like it is shown in this figure and moon will move around this dented space time and to us it will appear like moon is orbiting the earth okay whereas it is actually moving in the straightest possible path in a curved space time produced by the earth okay and that was einstein's great insight and this great insight comes from a very simple argument which we know from our school days that if you drop a feather and an apple this was the experiment uh, hypothetically done by galileo for the first time they fall with the same acceleration near the surface of the earth now that happens simply because gravitational force is proportional to inertial mass it should be proportional to something you should call as gravitational mass but what is experimentally found is for all the objects in the universe gravitational mass is proportional to inertial mass and that is the reason why all objects fall with the same acceleration in a gravity field that does not happen for example for charges if you put two charges in electric field they will fall with different accelerations but for gravity in a gravitational field they'll fall with same acceleration uh, i wanted to give this point because i should just emphasize that it took us 2000 years to even realize that this question requires further probing if people since the time of aristotle had only dropped a feather and an apple in a properly controlled experiment they would have arrived at this thought but nobody nobody even thought of doing the experiment and it was einstein who first looked deeply into this question after all these years and eventually uh, came to the answer that everything falls at the same rate under gravity simply because they are following a fixed path in the geometry of space time so they are not being acted upon by some force but rather they are moving in some kind of a curved geometry because of which they all seem to be moving in the same fashion they have the same acceleration okay so we have come a full circle we started with the space time of newton because of special relativity uh, our notion of future and past changed because nothing can travel faster than light we only have a limited access to the future and limited information from the past that we can obtain and finally einstein comes and says that even gravity is not a fundamental force but rather gravity is nothing but another name for the distorted structure of space time okay. so to explain this distorted structure of space time you again go back to your experiment with feather and apple you know that in a small enough lab if you do the experiment they will turn out to fall with the same acceleration of 9.8 meter per second square but if you go to a slightly bigger lab you know that this is actually not true in a slightly bigger lab you will actually see the apple and the feather coming nearer to each other because you know that they are both falling towards the center of the earth so if you were restrict in the lab to the bigger lab you might actually conjecture that there is some kind of a force of attraction between the feather and the apple okay you don't know what kind of a gravity field they are moving in but if you just are restricted to the lab to that is what you will conclude okay so the way i like to give you a picture of what can be the relation between force and curvature imagine ants moving on surface of a sphere if they have to follow the straightest possible line on a sphere they will move along a great circle okay and this is how they will seem to be moving but if the sphere is invisible to you then it might appear that the ants are being attracted towards each other by an invisible force what einstein said is that is precisely how gravity behaves it's not a force but it's rather objects moving in some abstract curved space time and it appears to us this curvature of space time 
appears to us as some kind of a force which we have been calling as gravitational force okay and of course it has measurable effects uh, gravitational forces produce what are called as tidal effects it it causes tides in our oceans it can also stretch you or compress you we don't feel these forces because earth's gravity is too weak but as i will argue in the next few minutes near a black hole these forces will be extremely strong okay so that they are going to cause realistic effects okay these tidal forces so i will conclude this discussion of gr very elementary gr by giving you einstein equations in words rather than formula or mathematical expressions einstein equations simply tell you that curvature of space time is equal to the energy and momentum of the matter in the space time for example if you have earth you will have mass of the earth giving it uh, giving it its energy you will have some momentum associated with the earth that produces a curvature in space time this cur curvature of space time then dictates how smaller objects like the moon behave in the vicinity of the earth okay so uh, the mathematical basis for this came from people like riemann minkowski and einstein i am just giving you a pictorial version of einstein equations the math comes from the work of riemann minkowski which were packaged by albert einstein in a complete formalism okay. so this is the summary for those of you who have already studied general relativity there are two ingredients in general relativity one is that space time tells matter how to move i have already told you this if the space time is curved that curvature the metric tensor determines how objects move in space time and matter tells space time how to curve that is if there is something like an earth cap there that will produce a curvature of space time according to einstein equation okay so uh, those are the mathematical details which i'll skip if somebody has a question i can come back later on okay, okay. now one of the predictions of general relativity are these very mystical objects called as black holes and black holes actually were not first predicted by general relativity but they they were there in the late uh, 18th century for example when certain uh, in fact a couple of people john michel and pierre laplace they gave an argument that if a star becomes so dense that the escape velocity from the surface of the star equals the speed of light then even light will not be able to escape that object okay however there was no newtonian derivation of uh, such kind of stars because newtonian gravity was not strong enough and newtonian gravity runs into trouble explaining the existence of such dark stars however curiously you can take your newtonian 10 plus 2 uh, level expression for escape velocity put the escape velocity equal to speed of light and what you get is that if the radius of the star is related to its mass by this formula it will become very dark because light will not be able to escape from it and what happens is that einstein's theory of general relativity gives you exactly the same answer you solve these complicated equations which i just displayed for a massive object and you show that it can become a black hole if its radius is smaller than 2 gm by c square and that's going to play an important role in what i'm going to say next So uh, again, a little bit of math, but you can just uh, ignore the slide if uh, if you have not studied a bit of GR. Okay, it's not very important for what I am going to speak about next. But this is the solution of Einstein equation, which actually tells you uh, when a, what a black hole would look like, what an external uh, field outside a black hole would look like. This d s square is just uh, the square of the distance between space time points. it is the generalization of your pythagoras expression dx square plus dy square plus dz square okay uh, and there are many curious features coming out of this black hole solutions most importantly they have been observed and uh, very recently we have observed a smoking gun for very super, uh, very massive black holes in a nearby galaxy that was deduced not just uh, by what is become famous as black hole shadows they were photographed very recently but also by the detection of gravitational waves which gave an estimate for very very super massive black holes in uh, the center of the galaxies okay. so we have good observational evidence that black holes exist and that is the summary of black holes 
So black holes are simplest solutions of Einstein equations and they have an event horizon. That's the boundary at the radius I have just indicated 2 gm by c square. Uh, you can compute that quantity for Earth as well as the sun and the numbers are given on this slide. You see that for Earth, that radius is just five centimeters. And that is the reason why Earth is not a black hole because the radius of the Earth itself is much larger than five centimeter. So Earth has definitely, uh, only if Earth collapses to a radius less than five centimeter, will it become a black hole? And that's not going to happen. It's almost the same for the sun, but we'll have to wait for sun to complete it its life cycle because the radius of the sun is immensely larger than three kilometers. It's not a black hole. If it collapses massively, it might become a black hole, but that depends on other kind of physics, which I'm not going to discuss here. Okay. So as far as we are concerned, this horizon surface is a boundary to the accessible universe. Once you cross the horizon of a black hole, you cannot come back to the outside. And that is their real uh, uh, key feature. Once you cross the event horizon, you, the information is just lost. You cannot transmit any information outside the event horizon in any possible way. Okay, and this is usually a cartoon way in which a black hole is depicted. Okay, it's a the time runs on the vertical axis. Two-dimensional space is what I have detected uh, depicted here, and this is collapsing matter. So you can just imagine a huge cloud of gas which starts to collapse, a spherical ball of gas which is collapsing under its own gravity. Its radius keeps on becoming smaller as time progresses in the vertical direction. And at some point, the radius of the gas ball crosses 2 gm by c square, the event horizon radius. The moment that happens, you have a black hole which forms in space time. Inside a black hole is something which we call as a singularity. It's a point of infinite density. We have absolutely no idea what happens at the singularity. But space and time behaves very, very weirdly inside the event horizon of a black hole. Okay. And the way to depict it is to actually remember the very first slides that I had shown. You remember those orange colored cones I had shown when describing to you special relativity. Those cones, the boundary of the cones tell you how light moves in a given space time. So if you have to move in a curved space time, you have to move inside the light cone. What happens in a black hole space time is that just inside the event horizon, as you can see here, light cones are completely tipped over. Okay, they keep bending. So, this is, for example, the light cone in flat space time. As you go near the horizon, the light cones keep getting tilted and they completely flip over when you are inside a black hole, which means that since you are only allowed to move inside the light cone by laws of special relativity, you will eventually go and hit the singularity the moment you are inside a black hole. If you are outside, you can escape. If you are inside, you cannot escape. Okay. So this is the point from where uh, interesting things begin to happen. And it is now that I'm going to start describing to you the work which uh, me, as well as partly in collaboration with Paddy, we have been trying to do. And that is, uh, that what can all this physics of black holes tell us about uh, this, the region of space-time where all three constants, Planck constant, gravitational constant, speed of light become important. So far they look completely disconnected, but let me try to establish the connection. The first connection came from the result of Hawking and Beck and Steele, who showed that black holes look like thermodynamic objects. The second connection comes from the work in which Paddy himself was involved long back, and that was that there is a limit to how accurately you can measure, measure space-time intervals. There's a fundamental limit, although the number is extremely small, no experiments are going to be able to probe it in the near future, but it exists. I mean, there is a limit to our information that you can gain about space-time. So here are the laws of black hole mechanics, and you can compare them with your laws of textbook thermodynamics. There is a zeroth law which says that surface gravity is constant over the horizon of the black hole. Now surface gravity, if you replace it by temperature, this just looks like the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Temperature is constant in an object which is in thermal equilibrium. Similarly, there is a first law which says that uh, this particular combination is equal to internal energy changes of the black hole, plus some work terms, something like PdV. So basically TdS equal to dE plus PdV. Again, that looks very, very, close to first law of thermodynamics. 
there is even a second law called as the area law which says that the area of a black hole can only increase in any physical process so if two black holes merge the area of the final black hole will always be larger than the sum of areas of the original black hole now this looks tantalizingly similar to the th uh, second uh, second law of ordinary black hole uh, ordinary thermodynamics the entropy law that entropy of a closed system always increases okay so that is what gave birth and this was seminal work by stephen hawking beckenstein bardeen carter and some of the other people that if you incorporate quantum mechanics black holes behave like a thermodynamic object and they satisfy all these laws okay and this has very very interesting implications suppose you take a cup of coffee and you throw it across the event horizon of a black hole that cup of coffee will have some entropy and for all purposes you have actually destroyed the entropy because in once inside the black hole no information about that cup of coffee can be communicated outside eventually it will go and hit the singularity like i just said so the entropy of the outside world has decreased and you have actually violated the second law of ordinary thermodynamics simply by throwing a hot object across the horizon of a black hole and this was a very famous question which can be answered by saying that black holes themselves do not have zero entropy but they have a finite entropy and it was a very big famous result that entropy of a black hole should be proportional to its area that is you take event horizon as a sphere of radius 2 gm by c square 4 pi r square is the area of the event horizon and that one quarter of that is what is called as the hawking beckenstein or beckenstein hawking entropy of a black hole okay. and then you can generalize the laws and all those things i am not going to describe this but the final result is in the last equations here so the final punch line is that black holes have a temperature given by this expression please notice that there is a edge bar which comes here so you know that you are doing a quantum mechanical calculation and black holes also have an entropy which is given by one quarter of area of the event horizon divided by lp square where this lp is the planck length 10 to the power minus 33 cm that i indicated earlier okay or some number of the same order so these were the three results from black hole and they are very robust results i mean you can for example run a carnot cycle keeping the black hole as one part of the heat engine some system at a higher temperature here and you can run a carnot cycle you can even compute the efficiency of such a carnot cycle okay so what i am trying to convince you is that there is a real thermodynamic nature associated with black holes okay. surprisingly what happens is that what happens near a black hole can be shown to happen also in ordinary flat space time if you are looking at accelerated observers okay. that is if you are in ordinary flat space time without gravity without black hole but you are accelerating then it turns out that you will also associate some kind of a temperature with the vacuum the quantum vacuum that you see will appear to you as a thermal state the temperature that you will attribute to the vacuum is given by the famous unruh temperature h bar g by 2 pi c and the entropy per unit area is again one quarter lp square so basically what you have done you should appreciate the drastic uh, jump that you have made here you have started with very very robust laws that you figured out by looking at black hole solutions and incorporating quantum mechanics and from there it is possible to show that similar things apply to ordinary space time even without gravity even without black holes and this was the fundamental starting point of what is called as the emergent gravity paradigm which uh, which is one of the things which paddy have contributed immensely to and the idea here is that forget about black holes just look at ordinary space time and suppose you are uh, so i think i'll just uh, skip this slide and go to the final thing yeah this one so suppose you are in ordinary space time and suppose there is a surface which is indicated by the red line here across which you cannot across which you cannot get any information from so it's something like a, a horizon of a black hole but you are not in a black hole space time you are in flat space time but sub, because you cannot transmit signals greater than the speed of light a point here will not be able to communicate to you if you are in the region 1 a point in region 2 cannot communicate with you again if you throw a cup of coffee across what is called as the horizon this red line will act again like a black hole horizon for you 
then again the same arguments will apply and you will actually have to say that entropy uh, the second law will be violated unless you attribute an entropy to this horizon so there is a very very realistic way in which you can attribute a temperature to any what is called as a null surface or as a light like surface in space time you don't need a black hole to do that and this is what gives rise to a very very surprising and very interesting connection between gravity and thermodynamics so a good part of paddy's work initial work in which i was also working for my phd was to show that einstein equations are nothing but equations of thermodynamics in disguise okay that's the connection between gravitational dynamics and horizon thermodynamics and requires some bit of work to show that okay and what we were eventually able to show is that for a very very large class of space times einstein equation which i have symbolically denoted here are nothing but the first law of thermodynamics this result was first established by paddy for spherically symmetric black holes in einstein's theory and we could prove that it's actually a much more robust result it holds in any kind of space time not just black hole space time and for even for theories of gravity which are not having the equations written here which have more complicated equations so it's just a very deep fact about the structure of space time itself okay so that's the connection between gravity and thermodynamics which largely became famous as the precursor to the emergent gravity paradigm okay emergent gravity paradigm tells you that gravity is not a fundamental force it emerges from something else and this notion becomes very very strong if you show that einstein equation which actually tells you what a gravitational field produced by an object is you solve the equations you get a gravity field if you are saying that these equations are similar to equations of thermodynamics like i've stated here then it makes sense to believe that because the subject of thermodynamics arises from the subject of statistical mechanics okay you consider a statistical mechanics of a large number of particles say a box of ideal gas you average in a certain way over the motion of all the particles and you get the laws of thermodynamics that's the connection between statistical mechanics and thermodynamics so if you are saying that einstein equations are like equations of thermodynamics the next natural question is what is the nature of the statistical mechanics which gives rise in an averaged sense to this kind of a thermodynamics and that is the question whether there are what are technically called as degrees of freedom of space time whose statistical mechanics in a suitable limit gives you the thermodynamics of space time which are interconnected which is interconnected with einstein equations and that is what brings us to the small scale structure of space time you know it is like you 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 start by a hot box of ideal gas but if you really want to understand where is the temperature coming from what is the interpretation for temperature you actually zoom in look at the individual atoms or molecules you actually track the kinetic energy of each atom and molecule and then you will figure out that the average kinetic energy of the entire set com comprising your box of ideal gas when you average over the kinetic energy of all individual atoms and molecules you get the temperature that's the interpretation of temperature at a more fundamental level in the same way if you want to understand where the thermodynamics of space time is coming from you should actually put a zooming lens and look at the small scale structure of space time okay so i'll spend the next few minutes uh, professor prabhu can i can you please tell me how much time i have left hello hello yeah yeah you have 20 minutes more 20 minutes 20 minutes yeah no problem oh, okay excellent yes 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 yeah so uh, now we will go to the small scale structure of space time in the hope that at very small scales if you are able to identify the analog of what in your ordinary statistical mechanics are atoms or molecules if you can identify such elementary entities constituting space time then maybe their behavior when you average it over will give you the thermodynamics of space time so that will be the next part of the talk and that is when we got back to this old result which was mentioned earlier that was by paddy when he showed that uh, you can view planck length as the zero point length of space time 
that is really the starting point what it means is that uh, as you probe space time at smaller and smaller scales the moment you come to the planck scale the moment you go to a length scale which is like 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters something drastic happens and you cannot no matter what kind of instruments you are using you cannot accurately measure distances between events below this length scale and this is just like in your ordinary uncertainty principle this is not tied to your inability to do experiments accurately but this is more tied to the fundamental nature of general relativity and quantum mechanics it's not just an experimental restriction it is a more fundamental restriction coming from some basic physics arguments so i'll go back to the first very first few slides i have i was showing you this dimensional pyramid and all so now we have come to this domain where uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics are supposed to be combined the length scales are very small and you want to talk about space time not at very large scales like einstein was doing you want to talk about space time at very small scales so maybe all the standard tools that we have learned from geometry are not going to apply anymore so i'll just indicate to you uh, without any mathematics what kind of arguments tell you that planck length is the ultimate fundamental lower bound on measurement of distances and times uh, using just the basic laws of general relativity so this example for example so one of the simplest example is you take a clock which is moving on this curve shown here and you want to measure the precise location of an event very near the trajectory of the clock okay so you send light signals there and you receive them back from the information of the time of sending the light signal and receiving it you can actually figure out what is the x coordinate y coordinate z coordinate of this event and you can also you know predict the time coordinate of the event however you should realize that, that if the clock becomes too massive if it becomes very massive then it will become a black hole because we just now saw that einstein theory says that if you have an object which which is smaller than the size of its event horizon it would become black hole the moment it becomes a black hole you cannot measure anything to an accuracy better than the size of the event horizon of the black hole because no information from within the event horizon of a black hole is possible so if you combine all these arguments in a heuristic way you can show not very difficult to show i am not going to do the steps here but you can show that your position uncertainties would be greater than l that's what we wanted to show but there's a fundamental bound and there was large deluge of paper in the 60s mostly where this kind of thought experiments were given a more mathematical structure okay and some of the reviews and all for those of you who are interested you could look up these reviews i can come back to it later but uh, if you stare deeply at it at the heart of it lies the fact that if you were only doing your college level quantum mechanics and if you are if you were using a probe of energy e to measure space time distances quantum mechanics tells you that uh, you know the length scales you will probe will go like h bar c by e this is just your compton wavelength written in a fancy manner on the other hand general relativity tells you that gm by c square is the length scale associated with a probe of mass m or you can use e equal to mc square to write that statement in terms of energy okay the crucial thing is the quantum mechanical length scale is inversely proportional to energy whereas the gravitational length scale is directly proportional to energy so if you plot both of them and probe the length scales uh, plot the length scale versus the energy there is some point at which these two plots the two curves will intersect that intersection point by elementary mathematics is going to come out to be the planck length so this is the mathematical statement of the fact that if you try to put too much of energy in probing too small a region of space time eventually a black hole will form and it will prohibit you from probing the space time any further combine these two facts and you get a fundamental lower bound and this was also the essentially the content of all the thought experiments which uh, paddy wrote extensively about in one of the early days of his research okay so i'm just trying to give you a gist of those arguments and now comes the big question and this started when i was just completing my phd work 
and that's when we started me and Paddy started thinking about this point that can we somehow incorporate the existence of such a lower bound of length scale in the very foundations of geometry so space time geometry will no longer be described by the standard mathematics that we know but by something else where this kind of a length scale is inbuilt and I will just try to set your intuition right. So what you do in ordinary geometry is that if you have two points like P and Q, which I have depicted here, vertical axis is time, horizontal axis in, is your two dimensional space for simplicity X and Y. Pythagoras tells you that the distances between points is just dx square plus dy square. That's how you find distance between two points in the XY plane. In special relativity, the distance will be minus C square dt square plus dx square plus dy square. That's the basic result in special relativity. However, you know that all these distances will be equal to zero when the two points are coincident. It's, it's such an elementary fact that we never think about it, but it is one of the axioms of what is called as uh, metric spaces. Okay, So when two points lie on top of each other, the distance between them should be zero. Okay, It's a very elementary fact. It sounds a bit like stupidity to actually even emphasize it. However, what we have just now said, what I just said here, let me just go back. What I've said in thought experiments like this, you can interpret this as an indication that if you have a quantum space time, because there is an inherent uncertainty in measuring or localizing a space time point, you cannot localize it better to the accuracy given by the Planck scale. Probably your, the axiom of metric spaces that you have to violate is that the distances between any two points do not go to zero when the points are coincident. Okay, It's a very, very weird way of incorporating the quantum effects, but we know that the quantum mechanics is weird. So what you're saying is you modify your geometry in a manner such that distances between points do not go to zero when the points sit on top of each other. However, they go to this finite non-zero value. Uh, and there's very interesting connection of this uh, with some of the ideas which Riemann had when he gave his famous lecture in Göttingen in 1854. This was the lecture which started the whole field of geometry, Riemannian geometry. And he already said, I would like you to read this time, that validity of the hypothesis of geometry in the infinitely small is bound up with the question of uh, metric relations of space. So it has to come from physics. That's what he says in the last line. And probably this is the first hint. Quantum physics is telling us that maybe the assumptions on which ordinary foundations of geometries are based will not hold when quantum mechanics is taken into account. Okay. So for that, we actually introduce certain tools, which I'm not going to describe in much detail. But the tools are really based on very, very simple ideas that you take any two point in space time like y and z connect them by a curve which is technically called as a geodesic and the distance square of distance between the geodesics is given by the letter omega from this omega you can reconstruct the whole of space time okay for example this was the conventional einstein picture i had showed you in the beginning of the talk that you know something curves the geometry there's a rubber model something like a moon moves in this curve geometry and you describe this geometry by the metric tensor the metric tensor tells you how to measure distances in a curved space time. What we tried to do was replace the metric tensor by a new object, which is simply equal to the distance between two points. Okay. Metric tensor is an object which is a matrix, a four by four matrix, whereas this guy is just a function of two points. It gives you a number. That number is the square of distance between any two points in space time. Our main idea was that you start with this as your basic variable and then try to reconstruct space time. What you should be able to show is that if uh, Planck's constant is set to zero in the end of the calculation, you should recover your Einsteinian picture of space time. If the Planck constant is finite, you will get some corrections from quantum mechanics. So we did all this mathematical construction. This is just a pictorial representation of what I said. And the idea was that if you are on a length scale which are very large, much larger than your Planck length, your space time just looks like what Einstein said. 
if you go to very small length scales there will be distortions produced because of quantum mechanical effects and we wanted to capture some measure of how big those distortions could be okay and what we interestingly could derive were what we called as relics of quantum space time we could show that if you do this with einstein's theory if you take uh, what is called as the action einstein hilbert action for gravity and do this exercise you can show that uh, entropy density of space time any space time has associated with it an entropy density which is given by some object like this doesn't matter what that object is all that matters is this rav again a 4 by 4 matrix is related to the curvature of space time and ta tb are just tangent vectors to the geodesics in space time okay the reason this is important is because it ties very well with the emergent gravity paradigm uh, which was given by paddy before which said that you should start with entropy of space time which is given by precisely an expression like this and that entropy density of space time can reproduce for you einstein equations and all the same effects with general relativity also predicts okay so basically what we have essentially shown is that if you have a quantum space time one of its relics could give you an explanation of where einstein equations actually come from and there are other uh, sorry there are other nicer things and uh, if you want a textbook level description of such relics it also appears if you do a non relative uh, relativistic expansion of wave function of a relativistic particle so you take a relativistic particle you expand it in the speed of light one over the speed of light you expect to get schrodinger equation or schrodinger wave function in the end because schrodinger equation is the non relativistic version of relativistic equation but actually you don't get back the wave function you get a wave function multiplied by some phase so this is what i mean when i say relic so sometimes it can happen that your space time is fundamentally quantum mechanical there is an h bar planck constant sitting there but your classical space time although doesn't see the planck constant because by definition classical uh, physics assumes h bar equal to 0 there might be some relics some effects of quantum space time which are left over even after taking the limit h bar equal to 0 so there could be some residual effects which can explain some of the phenomena in the universe that i'll mention in the last few slides and one very interesting consequence of this which i deduced uh, uh, along with paddy and sumanto later on is that it very interestingly tells you that if you probe your space and time at very very small scale the dimension of space time from the familiar four dimensions three space dimensions and one time dimension is how you describe your space time but if you go to very very small scales and use our mathematical construction you can show that space time effectively becomes two dimensional okay this is something which is very curious and there is a mathematics behind this but effectively this graph will tell you the uh, tell you what is going to happen you define effective dimension of space time at very very large distances the dimension is 4 you can see it here three of space and one of time but if you start going to very small scales the dimension drops to two surprisingly this kind of what is called as dimensional reduction is well known in many many different approaches to quantum gravity however we have been able to show that it can be a very very generic feature of a quantum space time with no information of you know what is your full framework for quantum gravity we have not used anything like string theory or loop quantum gravity or anything else we have just used some very basic ideas about zero point length planck length and some of the features from classical differential geometry and that is enough to give you this result okay so to summarize uh, what i have tried to indicate in this talk is that there are already clues from what is called as semi classical gravity that is you do gravity with some little bit of quantum mechanics although not fully quantum mechanical treatment and you get insights like space time should have thermodynamic properties things like entropy are intrin intrinsically coupled to the curvature of space time so you get insights like this and the key question sorry the key question is how does your fundamental picture of physics the final framework of quantum gravity arise out of these kind of semi classical clues 
that is the notion known as emergence okay so you know that classical gravity uh, emerges from some more microscopic degrees of freedom exactly how they emerge is not known because we do not know what those degrees of freedom are there are various contending approaches string theory loop quantum gravity causal dynamical triangulations and all but we can work in an intermediate domain where these fundamental frameworks are not of much relevance but quantum mechanics is still important and that is the domain which i have been calling as the mesoscopic space time intermediate scale at which your quantum space time will have the properties i have indicated in the talk okay. and as i have already told you it gives you a quantum metric which we have called as q metric it gives you the entropy functional like i have told you for the emergent gravity paradigm that was initially hypothesized by paddy along with uh, uh, other uh, coworkers and it also has something to say about euclidianization which i am not going to speak about in this talk so just to conclude quantum structure of space time can provide perhaps the most direct evidence of its emergent properties these emergent properties were deduced by looking at the thermodynamic properties of space time okay similarly the entropy functional which can replace einstein hilbert action and give you a more fundamental description of gravitational dynamics can be explained by building the space time with a minimal length using some non local mathematical tools and there are also some aspects which arise uh, in the structure of euclidean action which i have not discussed in this talk so i'll not focus on that too much and the final big question is can any of this yield any insights into the dynamics of gr at low energies i have already put in hints everywhere in the talk that yes in the limit of very large scales the one where we can do experiments some insights can be obtained from dynamics of gr although things will not look very different because you are looking at very large scales quantum mechanics will not have effects on those scales so that is the open question the question of cosmological constant and the question of space time singularities so paddy had made quite a bit of progress in using these tools to address his favorite problem of the cosmological constant and space time singularities is something we have been working on for a while but no progress so far has been made on what this can tell about the structure of space time singularities so i would like to end here and take questions if there are any <clears throat> thank you thank you professor sure. for your very enlightening and interesting lecture your basic uh, uh, title of your lecture was space time and gravity you started with uh, paying tribute to professor tanu patmanabhan by sharing your memories and thoughts and uh, then <clears throat> you uh switched over to the technical presentation you gave uh, a landscape of physical theories and uh, referred to heisenberg's theory planck's constant etc and uh, your uh, lecture was uh, uh, made into four uh, sections rather and the first section was uh, space time and gravity second was uh, gravity and thermodynamics third section was quantum space time and finally the implications and you could touch upon lot many phenomenon as well as uh, you you drawn from the history and also uh, uh, got uh, explain certain insight and clues from einstein's theories <clears throat> basically you also interestingly touched upon the puzzle of uh, feather and the apple you touched upon dark stars black holes and uh, entropy and the loss of black hole mechanism etc etc it was really interesting sir and uh, i request you to be with us for 5 to 10 minutes for interaction sure yeah so maybe we can have interactions maybe any questions or doubts participants can share uh, hello hello yeah yes yeah uh, uh, uh hi rabud it is uh, titus from kusat hi yes professor titus yeah, yeah, yeah. uh it was a nice uh, exposition indeed okay. yeah. uh, uh what i want to ask is uh, actually i need some clarifications 
Sure. See, uh, see, when we are considering the thermodynamics of space time, mm -hmm. gravity. So, uh, some element of uh, observational dependence, not some element, it is really observational dependence, correct? Observer dependence, yes, yes. Observer yeah. dependence. Yes, yeah. Oh, so, so that means that uh, only for an accelerating observer, uh, uh, the space time is uh, uh, having thermodynamic characteristics or even having microstructure, correct? Uh, well, uh, it's, so you deduce uh, the thermodynamic uh, nature does exist only for accelerated observers. So only okay. accelerated observers will attribute thermal properties to space time, which is I mean, okay. quantum fields are uh, prepared in the standard freely, what is called as freely falling vacuum. That part is mm -hmm. true. However, mm -hmm. once you uh, go to the frame of reference of accelerated observer, apply your thermodynamic properties, everything associated with the observer eventually cancels out because the equations you get in the end, suppose you were going to the frame of the accelerated observer and doing this first law of thermodynamics, mm -hmm. you apply TDS equal to d plus PdV by properly defining what is temperature, what is entropy, what is energy, what is volume, you get Einstein equations in the form GAB UAUB equals to TAB UAUB. Mm -hmm. So ideally one could stop there and say that it is observer dependent because UA, the four velocity is dependent on which observer you are looking at. But okay. it is at this stage that you say that you will apply it to all possible observers. Okay, that is one way of doing it. And the only way this equation holds for all possible accelerated observers is mm -hmm. if GAB is itself equal to TAB. Alternatively, one could also uh, show that a similar equation can be derived for null uh, vectors GAB KAKB equals to TAB KAKB. Okay, okay. And then you demand that uh, what you had actually, so uh, I would like to emphasize that although we focused on accelerated observers, mm -hmm. the main role was actually played by the light cones. And those light cones are independent of uh, the observer. So light cones are fundamental structures in space time. So once you are given the light cone structure of a given space time, you can always find a suitable observable, uh, so, I'm sorry, suitable observer for whom these light cones will act like horizons. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's so there is a, yeah, there's a duality in both the descriptions. Okay. So yes, the entire formalism starts by assigning a key role to accelerated observers, but the equations you derive for geometry the geometrical equations like GAV equal to TAV that you end up deriving, they are independent of the acceleration. So you mean the final equations are somehow come to be observer independent? Yes, yes, yeah. Therefore, you can uniquely uh, conclude that the space time has got a microstructure. Yes, yeah, that is the basic idea. However, uh, uh, if you notice in the second part of the talk, there were no accelerated observers. There were only two points in space time, geodesics connecting those points, and the tangent vector to the geodesics played the role of uh, what would have been UA, UB in case of accelerated observers. But we were really working with just uh, a manifold with two points and a distance function given between two points. So this is an example where you never introduce an observer but you still get RAB, TA, TB for the entropy density. So what it is really telling is that any time-like vector will do and presumably the quantum theory will have to sort of average over such time-like vectors. That is what Paddy was trying to develop towards the end. In the last few papers, if you look, uh, he had this notion that uh, if one averages over all possible time-like vectors in some suitable way, then maybe one can explain the emergence of Einstein Hilbert Lagrangian from a more microscopic Lagrangian, which actually seemingly depends on this time like vector. You can call it as observer dependent, but once you do a suitable averaging at the lowest order, you can end up deriving Einstein equations where there is no observer dependence. Okay, that's fine. 
Uh, one more question. So you have told towards the end of the talk that um, uh, the space time uh, in, its, uh, in its micro level has two dimensional. Yes, yeah. So that is the result we were able to show. So essentially the result is that uh, if you use the mathematical tools and just add one input that you know there is a zero point length in space time you cannot measure events to an accuracy better than Planck length then mm -hmm. your metric tensor of space time becomes highly non-local it is not even given by a local tensor it becomes like a non-local object and if you compute the volumes and areas using your standard expressions root root g root minus g d4x or root minus g d2x stuff like that you can actually define what is called as a, a box counting dimension so i think i had a slide there uh, is my slide still visible yes 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 ah, so let me just quickly indicate how that two dimension comes so suppose you have a sphere in three dimension its volume is four by three pi r cube so you can actually deduce that you are working in three dimension by looking at the exponent of this radius of the sphere, which is three here. So that works in any dimension. So volume in any dimension is just given to given by some constant times radius to the power d. Okay. So what we did was computed this volume using our quantum metric and tried to deduce the dimension from this expression. That is the expression given here. What do you mean by quantum metric? Quantum metric is the Q metric that we uh, construct by assuming that space time has a zero point length. Oh. Uh, so, so you are assuming zero point length, Planck yes. length as a zero. That is the only then different. Are... Yeah, that's the only extra then, input then... that we are making. Yeah. Okay, okay. So this is how the dimension goes. Okay. So, so this this could yeah yeah. This could be the reason why we are saying that the um, maybe the size of uh, what we, we can what we can we may uh, call as space time atom is LP square. Uh, yeah, that uh, it could be, but that we have really not because we are really not able to make uh, give any physical interpretation for what these two dimensions mean in the sense that if a four-dimensional okay. space time is looking like two-dimensional. Okay. How the two dimensions are disappearing, how the dimensional reduction is taking place, we have no idea. Yeah. And it is also, this is true for all the other approaches which give the same result. It's very difficult to say which two dimensions are getting lost. Okay, and that's still to be worked out. Yes, it's still to be worked out, yes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dao. Sure, Professor Travis. Yeah. Thank you, Professor uh, Titus Matthew. I think uh, Professor uh, Unnikrishnan Nair, sir, has raised his hand. Mm -hmm. He was a professor of physics a long time in Kerala University. Okay. Sir. Unnikrishnan, sir. Minimum, minimum length. Sir, kindly unmute, sir. Yeah, can't hear very, the volume is very low, actually. Sir, we can't hear properly. Can you hear here? Can you hear now? Uh, sir, what are you feeling? Yeah. Only on the board. Not audible, sir. So I think the question can also be typed in that chat. Uh, yeah, yeah. I can yeah. just tell you, what is the physical meaning of that minimum distance? Ah, uh, uh, so uh, physically, uh, that minimal length scale or minimum distance arises out of the thought experiment, some of which I indicated on a slide. So let me just move there and I can... Uh, Yeah, so uh, physically, I think this minimum distance is best understood by doing certain kind of thought experiments or Gedanken experiments in which you have a quantum probe like a clock depicted on that slide. And this clock 
is what you are you using to measure the coordinates of this space time event two because every time you want to assign coordinates to an event you have to you have to use some probes like rods and clocks so here you use a clock this is just one of the examples and you say that you will send a light signal it will hit the second event it will reflect from there it will reach you from the time difference between emission and reception you can figure out the distance to this event and similarly you can also figure out or assign a time coordinate to this event now this is well known in classical einstein relativity how to do it these are what are called as radar coordinates this how for example a radar would work in localizing objects what you now do is assume that the clock is also quantum mechanical so that its motion is now governed by the laws of quantum mechanics because of this your trajectory of the clock will itself have some uncertainties because the uncertainty principle would apply to the clock so you cannot ignore the recoil of the clock as the light beam is emitted and absorbed that's one thing the second thing is uh, so this is something that comes just from quantum mechanics the second thing is because the clock has mass uh, there is a certain limit on how massive the clock can be so for example you can make the clock very massive to make it quantum mechanically more accurate because quantum mechanically the compton wavelength goes like h bar by mc so if the clock is very massive your compton wavelength will be very small and so you can improve the accuracy of the measurement of event 2 by the clock because quantum effects will be smaller for the clock however we also know from general relativity that for very very large mass the clock might actually end up becoming a black hole the moment it becomes a black hole you cannot measure any event lying within the event horizon of that black hole so it's a balance between these two things uh, let me just uh, uh, i think my sharing window has gotten lost yeah so that that is the interplay i was talking about so this e you can just put it as mc square here for the clock so h bar by mc will be the quantum accuracy gm by c square will be the gravitational accuracy and these two effects are always computing uh, sorry always competing and that is i mean if you just plot these two you will show you, you will see that there is a lower uh, value of there's a lower bound on the value of l that you can measure just inter extrapolate between the two curves the curve will look something like this it will have a minimum at precisely gh bar by c cube ka square root and that is one of the that is just one of the things there are many other arguments which also indicate the same thing some of which are here okay. thank you thank you thank you sure you welcome yeah. yeah yeah that was uh, may i ask one more thing maybe uh... ah yes sir sure professor that yeah. is here yeah, yeah. And so what i want to ask is uh, uh, um, Uh, i hope your words are uh, uh, maybe encouraging to understand that see um, on the surface of black holes uh, the thermo i mean gravity behave like thermodynamics that is already understood by uh, hawking bardeen etc okay mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so in contrast to that uh, can you comment to what extent paddy's work was more general compared to that uh, so uh, compared to the standard uh, so yes yeah. compared to standard black hole yeah yeah i mean uh, the, the connection between thermodynamics and gravity is already known yeah. to hawking yes yes ah uh, yeah so that yeah. Uh, uh, i think uh, the key difference is that uh, in the conventional laws of uh, black hole mechanics let me again just keep the equation and picture so that it's clearer yeah so conventional laws of black hole mechanics i'm sorry i i'm just going to the slide uh, just give me one moment it's a, yeah this conventional laws of black hole mechanics what the d the differentials here mean and differentials are very important in thermodynamics as well when you say tds equal to d plus pdv these differentials are uh, 
between quantities defined on two equilibrium states of a given system so if you had an ideal gas you would you would take an ideal gas at an mm -hmm. at equilibrium state with energy e another ideal gas or the same ideal gas in an equilibrium state with energy e plus de and take the difference mm -hmm. so for black hole mechanics that is what these laws also mean you take two black holes of mass m m plus delta m and so on whereas in paddy's approach you essentially had just one system and what you are doing is perturbing that system by slightly changing a specific uh, you know the what is called as the location of the horizon the differentials here are essentially differences or differentials along the ingoing null vector defined everywhere on the horizon okay so you are so, sort of like pushing the horizon of a black hole and then what in classical mechanics one would call as a virtual displacement you are virtually distorting horizon of a black hole or horizon of an accelerated observer and those are the differential d's coming in the equation tds equal to de plus pdv okay so i think those you are not looking at two different black hole solutions and compute computing the difference by modifying the parameters you have a system and you are making a virtual displacement Okay. One more thing, I I need clarifications. See, black hole horizon is somewhat an actual physical horizon, correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, but the observer, but the uh, uh, horizon for an accelerating observer. Yeah. I don't know whether I can call it as a fictitious horizon. I mean, these two yes, horizons. Yes. Uh, so how can we? Uh, so one is an actual horizon, other is. Uh, some sort of a fictitious horizon, and you are uh, uh, making physics right. there and drawing conclusions. Yeah, but I think even for black holes, if there is a freely falling observer, although the horizon exists in slightly, like you are saying, a more realistic sense, you, for a freely falling observer, it will not exist, right? The freely yes, falling yes. observer will simply fall across the horizon without ever noticing it. Yes. So. Uh, in a sense yes accelerated observers will have uh, a fictitious horizon because some other observer will not see it but there is a certain complementarity even there i mean even for black holes because a freely falling observer will not uh, see the horizon but i agree there is a uh, uh, the horizon of a black hole comes because of the presence of mass yes which is crucial acceleration horizon is created the moment you start accelerating so there is a distinction between them but not in the context of observer dependence because observer dependence is also there for black holes now if one would have uh, one would want to come to the conclusion that space time has microscopic structure then uh, this thermodynamic characteristics of gravity on the surface of space a uh, black hole will not help us is it correct my statement uh, you mean for the uh, for the freely falling observer it won't help is that what you no no on the surface of the black hole you mm -hmm. know that uh, the uh, gravity is thermodynamics uh, okay I, uh, yeah in a sense you can say that yes because temperature and entropy are only associated yes. with the surface yes, yes. okay yes and yeah. from that is it possible to conclude that the space time has got a microstructure yeah 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 that was the initial uh, argument the best i know that was the initial argument because the initially microstates that people were interested in were the microstates that gave rise to entropy of the black hole so if you count those microstates you will get entropy of the black hole given by bekenstein ockerman so people tried to use the same microstates to describe also the microscope microscopic structure of not just black holes but also space time in general so i think there is a connection but what i discussed in the second part of the talk is not actually tied to horizons or black holes yes yes, yes. yeah yes. yeah fine thank you thank you yeah i think there will be more questions but because of the time constraints uh, we are compelled to come to a conclusion maybe if uh, any of the participant has got any doubt 
i think uh, i suggest you may refer iit madras website from which you can get the details of professor daud kotawala his email his phone number everything is available in that website and you can pursue our discussion with him i hope he would be happy only to answer that right sure, professor sure. Sure. Yes. Yeah, I'll be glad. The fi final question, I think, uh, Dr. C. B. was raising his hand. Dr. C. B. He is a professor and head of physics department, Kerala University. That will be the last question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Dawood, uh, I was just uh, curious to one of your slides, uh, like you mm -hmm. were mentioning about the emergent uh, phenomena, like quantum structure. of space time provides mm -hmm. the most direct evidence of emergent phenomena so this, uh, this the very words was also mentioned in uh, uh, tanu patnan sir's website that he is saying that during the last decade i have come upon uh, new perspectives in the field equations of gravity have the state same status as those in emergent phenomena like uh, fluid mechanics or elasticity mm -hmm. uh, here we have some few pg students who are looking forward to get some uh, simple analogy to that statement could you give some simple analogy to that statement yes so to the extent i know uh, uh, what paddy had been trying to do uh, is uh, basically uh, take the structure of quantum space time that i roughly tried to sketch coming out of uh, coming out of this work so what happens is if you try to describe space time at very small scales it turns out that tangent vectors to geodesics like this imagine the points are very close to each other and imagine that space time is a collection of such points then these tangent vectors play a crucial role in writing down the geometry of space time at very small scales so the analogy paddy was trying to make is that uh, you can give an analogous description in terms of a fluid uh, which is described by a distribution function right when you describe fluid in fluid mechanics you give a distribution function which is a function of xi and pi the position and the momenta of particles which are making the fluid so the idea was that the position would be just the coordinates of space time events in place of momenta would in in place of pi you would have the tangent vectors ti and that is what would describe the fluid of space time at very small scales so the idea was if somebody gives you a distribution function for this space time fluid you can define an entropy function in exactly a similar way like you would define a boltzmann entropy function for a classical fluid f log f ka integral and then when you vary it you would get back the equations of motion uh, governing the distribution function in the same way if you try to write down the distribution function for the space time fluid and suppose you have a clever choice for the distribution function you could vary it you could define an entropy corresponding to the distribution function vary it and get back your einstein equations or some equations which in the classical limit are similar to einstein equations so that is the picture that he has been trying to push for so basically something like a kinetic theory for atoms of space time and the kinetic theory you need a distribution function that distribution function had to be constructed by using these tangent vectors to geodesics and the coordinates of space time events uh yeah i thank hope you, that you. was a bit yeah thank you thank you yeah yeah thank you so we move on to concluding remarks while uh, thanking my colleague uh, dr p harinarayanan principal scientist of kcst who is uh, who being a co convener he has uh, struggled a lot to realize this uh, uh, the whole uh, event so may i request uh, dr harinarayanan for your concluding remarks please so dr nun sir the most respected uh, executive vice president of kcst professor kp suthi sir Uh, distinguished guests, uh, Professor Dabut, Professor uh, uh, Oni Krishnamayya, Professor C B, and uh, all others dignitaries in the webinar. We had actually paid tribute by way of engaging a 
five day webinar series. In the last five days we have discussed about the theories put forth by Professor Tanu Padmanabhan. And we had excellent speakers right from the on the day one we had uh, uh, our chief secretary of Kerala. It was actually delivered uh, a commemorative lecture itself by talking about the work done by Professor Tanu Padmanabhan while inaugurating the webinar series. And uh, Professor Somyak Rochavtari, the director of Ayuka, was also there. He has also paid tribute by pay, uh, paying respect to him and uh, talking about the association and work they have done together. On the day one, we had uh, Sri Ram Kumar, who was the professor, who is a professor of the Department of Physics IIT Madras, and who was actually a PhD scholar under who has obtained PhD under the guidance of Professor Tanu Patanaben. And uh, on day two, we had uh, it was associated with uh, Mahatma Gandhi University, the Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Sabu Thomas presided over the function, and uh, Professor Shankar Narayan, and again another student of Professor Tanu Patanaben, and recently Professor at the uh, Department of Physics, IIT Bombay, delivered the commemorative lecture. He also narrated the association and also the work what they have done together. And uh, on day three, we had Professor K.N. Malsudan, the vice, Honorable Vice Chancellor of uh, QSAT or Cochin University of Science and Technology as a president. And uh, Tirthankar Rao Chaudhary, Dr. Tirthankar Chaudhary, Rao Chaudhary, who is Associate Professor at the National Center for Radio Astrophysics, TAFR Pune, was the speaker. He is another uh, scholar who worked under Professor Tanu Patmanabhan and who had obtained his PhD degree from him. And on uh, day four, we had uh, uh, Professor M.K. Jairaj, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Calicut University as the President, and uh, Dr. Anil Bharatwaj, who is the present Director of Physical Research Laboratory at our ISRO in Ahmedabad, as a keynote speaker, or the commemorative lecture, lecture speaker. And uh, it was again, an, he has also worked out close in closely in association with Tanu Patanabe. He has narrated the, what they have done, what they have discussed, and also the he has presented the uh, lecture. On day five, we today we know that we had an excellent uh, lecture by Professor Dawood Kotawala and uh, Professor uh, Doctor C M C Dattan, the mentor science of Kerala government was there. He has also given. The, the association and also the many thoughts what put forward by uh, Professor Tanu Patmanabhan. We had our uh, executive vice president, Professor K.P. Sutir, and also in, on the chair today it was uh, Dr. V.P. Mahadevan Pilla, the vice chancellor of, honorable vice chancellor of Kerala University. And uh, now the remaining is uh, Dr. Uh, C.P. K.S. is there, who is the HOD, who is actually associated today to organize this program. In all these days, actually, a team uh, consisting of uh, activities it is not uh, audible not audible in between not audible very now it's okay yeah yeah now it's okay uh, we had a team from uh, with uh, sunil rohit and uh, nishant who were actually handling the uh, activities on the online activities and controlling the activities without any big issues actually we had we could organize with this uh, team uh, microsoft team this a uh, five day event and uh, in fact Dr. Ajit Prabhu, who was, who was the coordinator of this program or the convener of the program, has, from the day one onwards, he was completely involved and he was guiding us, he was taking us forward. And I think this uh, commemorative lecture has become a success in that way. And we had paid homage to the great scientists of the country or the world itself by way of uh, a webinar. And many students and uh, professors, uh, faculty members, scientists, uh, joined us all these days to be part of the webinar. So thank you all for from KCST side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karinarayanan. Before we come to the end, uh, maybe Sudhir sir would like to say something. Sudhir sir. I think sir is busy. So we will uh, move on to 
the most important uh, function of uh, this uh, uh, summarizing day, concluding day program that is a vote of thanks by an eminent academician and a scientist, Professor CBKS, who is the professor and head of uh, physics department, uh, University of Kerala. Uh, professor, please. Thank you. Today, we have come to the conclusion time of Friday, Professor Tanu Patmanavan commemorative webinar series organized jointly by Kerala government, KCST, and uh, the four brothers, Kerala University, Cochin University, MG University, and Calicut University. I feel uh, privileged to extend a vote of thanks to the esteemed invitees who have gathered here to pay homage to late Sir Tanu Padmanabhan. During the initial talks, when this commemorative series was planned, Dr. Ajit Prabhu, Chief Scientist Tech, has shared with me the necessity for a tribute to our great Paddy. I would like to share a small instance to the audience here about the gesture by Professor Tanu Patmanavan that personally moved me, which I shared with uh, Dr. Ajit Prabhu, sir, uh, on that time. So we, Department of Physics, University of Kerala, has planned 50 luminary lectures as a part of Golden Jubilee celebration in our department. We had inverted uh, Professor Tanu Patmanavan for an online lecture due to this current pandemic. However, he humbly replied that he wanted to make the lecture offline. Please note that it was not a no to our call, but it was a big ace. He added that he will come to Kerala University shortly as our government was planning to award him his for his scientific contributions. The reason for his choice for this offline class was interesting. When he explains, uh, he, wa he was saying that he, when he explains science, he want to get a real-time feedback from the students' faces so that the proper knowledge dissemination is done. Uh, these words will only come from great teachers. All the speakers shared the same thought elaborately, especially uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. VP Mahadevan Plasa, uh, and Sri MC Dattan, former director VSSC, Dr. Davud Kotwala, Professor, Department of Physics, IIT Madras, Professor K.P. Sudhir, Executive Vice President, KCST, and my dear friends, Dr. P. Harinarayanan and Dr. V. Ajit Prabhu, uh, KCST, and also my colleague, Dr. Titus, sir. I extend my wholehearted gratitude to our esteemed panel in the webinar for their presence and for sharing their insights with us that made this event possible and thereby touching many young minds who were listening to the lectures online. A big thank you, sir. Last but not least, I would like to conclude the commemorative webinar series with a message shared by our loving Paddy. In his blog, uh, in his web page, it is written like this. One day, Akbar asked Tansen, Tansen, you say that uh, he taught you music. Clearly, it is uh, it is clear that your teacher has held back some techniques from you. So Tansen replied, no, and added that he knew all the techniques of music that his teacher does. Then Akbar curate that, but Tansen, then how uh, do you account for such difference in quality? Uh, then uh, Tansen replies, it is simple because my teacher sings for Yamuna while I sing for Badshah. Maybe that is the reason why Paddy is a great teacher, researcher, and a philosopher, because he has sung the theories for nature. Dear sir, madam, and friends, let us revamp our approach to higher education sector. Let us approach science in a way that Paddy did. I know for sure that there are many Paddies listening to my speech. Thank you all once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. CB. So <clears throat> we are ending this uh, five day long commemorative lecture series to pay homage to 
uh, Professor Tanu Patmanabhan. Once again, uh, pranam to Professor Tanu Patmanabhan. Uh, Dr. Dawood, once again, thanks to you from Kerala State Council for Science, Technology and Environment and on behalf of Government of Kerala. Thank you. And uh, thank you all the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for inviting. Bye.